I'm gonna right. I've got I've got a very specific. You've got a, a list. All right, excellent. A, li a little list because I wanted to um, I wanted to ask you about this first before we crack into obsidian in in some depth. I wondered if we could frame the conversation just a little bit. And so I'm going to I'm going to pitch this idea to you and see what you think. So. I'm coming at this from a position of, well, a bit of background. You told me about Obsidian months ago and you said, go and have a look. And I went and had a look and did a poor job of having a look, it has to be said. But my immediate impression was, has actually persisted since I've been doing more work on it. So I come to the conversation today with quite a specific question. Now, I, I wonder whether it's not worthwhile if we're going to distribute this message out to people to say there are resources to go and look at on YouTube and maybe we can curate some links for people. If you just want to get a flavor of what Obsidian is and when you see the screen share that hopefully you're going to see from you, it'll make a bit more sense, but we can do a bit of background stuff. But rather than getting into the background stuff, because the problem that I've had with Obsidian so far is everything I've heard about has been about what I think is probably the first half of Obsidian, which is maybe in simple terms, the kind of creative part of writing notes and making links and then seeing those links grow. And this enormous matrix built around all of these kind of ideas that you might have. I listened to Inga and Jason's uh, podcast, you know, on the rig which is a great podcast series, although the last episode, I think, is two and a half hours long. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's quite a bit of chat in the first half hour about what's going on in their lives, which you can kind of, I think you can skip through. I do, yes. It's not, yes, nice. But it, but but in Jason's case, he was he's a real obsidian evangelist. It seems he's come to it and he loves it. And the example he gave was a great example of doing in Australia what's called a TEXA review, which is, I think, if you work in higher ed, every five or six years, your whole university gets reviewed for its academic quality. So it's everything from the highest level governance right down to the delivery of individual courses and all the minutiae. So he's taken on this project for his university, and it's an enormous piece of work. And I've known people spend three or four years at the very high level building up rooms full of documentation to support one of these reviews. So he's using Obsidian to find all of the material that he's going to need for this review, but not just do it in a traditional kind of filing structure, it seems, but to create a 3D matrix, a map of the links between things. So this is the point where I get to and I think, yeah, this is great. Although nagging in the back of my mind is this constant question about is this going to be worth it? What happens then is where I start to become interested and in, in where I think my barrier, my obstacle is. This is the threshold concept for me. I love the idea that you can make all these connections. It sounds really creative that you can make these notes and you can pull all these things together. It seems to me at that point then the whole project falls over because instead of having something simple to turn into what's going to have to be a two-dimensional linear report for Texa or a PhD thesis or a book or something like that, you've now got this overwhelming mass of swirling stuff with multiple networks and nodes. And that seems to me to be exactly getting in the way yes. of actually doing something productive with it. <clears throat> right. So the conversation I would love to have with you today is about what you use it for and how you actually use this matrix once you've built it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you filter right. through everything to make something actually useful yeah. to it. So I think that's fine. And I think the to start off with, I would say that the, in Obsidian, you have the concept of vaults, which is, uh, it's like a folder, um, but it's a folder that's separated from other vaults within Obsidian. And so what a lot of people tend to do when I've seen people using Obsidian is they combine all of these things together. So. I have three different vaults for Obsidian. The one is called Daily Notes. 
The one is called Commonplace, like a commonplace book, which is the collection of ideas. And then I have a writing vault. And those three things are separate. And those notes don't talk to each other and they're not aware of each other. So your question about how do you write and not have all those things get in the way of it? Well, I write in a writing vault that's completely separate to the idea generating vault. So if I just start sharing my screen. Are you happy for me to interject the questions or do you want me to just let you flow for a while? No, you stop. Anytime. What would you prefer? Can, uh, anything you want. Can you just okay? Can, so you, can you see my screen? I can see me. Can you see yeah. that? Now I've yeah. There you go. Right. Okay, okay. So straight away, I've got a question, okay. which is that the stuff that goes into your daily notes. If you then want to write with it, you've just said that that vault is completely separate and doesn't talk yes. to the writing vault. So presumably, yes. you have to move it from one into the other. No, no, because I'm writing. So I'll write and I'll just write. And then if I hit, if I come up against the wall and I don't know what to write anymore, then I'll go to my idea vault and I'll query something from the idea vault. I'll go to the idea vault for ideas, not to write. So well, what are you writing about if not ideas? So I feel like I need to show you. Um, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so, okay, so what you're looking at now, this is my daily notes vault. So just to give you an example, I'll start a new note and I'll start it here on Monday the 21st. It says the file yeah. does not exist, do you wanna create it? So this is my daily note um, template. So yeah. because it's text, you can create your own templates and yeah. these are all the things that I'm gonna be doing for the day. And I use this to, um, like if I have a meeting, then I, create links to meeting notes and, and blah, blah, blah. So this is the kind of just every day I, I make notes in yeah. this vault, but also have this commonplace vault. And that's obviously just from commonplace book. And this is a place where I just dump ideas and you'll see it kind of looks the same here, but it's a little bit different. So I've set up the tabs um, on this side, the panels on the right and the left side yeah. a little bit differently. So if I pick this one, then you can see that the local graph displays here. So immediately I can get a sense of how many other things this note is connected to. But that's um, only within the commonplace vault. This is only within commonplace. So these notes are all very short. They, you know, tags, I connect to other notes. I can see incoming links. I can see outgoing links. I can see unlinked mentions. This is where I capture all of my literature notes. So if I'm reading a book, um, like at the moment, I'm reading this book on embodied computing. As I'm reading all of this content, everything that I highlight and annotate in that book gets pulled into these literature notes. So that's all an automated right. process. Same thing happens with articles, podcasts, tweets. Um, I've got conference notes going back 10 years. Um, those are all in here. And this is just a place for me to play around with ideas. So I'll go through these notes. Yeah. I'll link to other notes and, and so on. So you feel fairly good with how that works. And then I have a writing vault. And if I want to, I don't know, here's a little thing on citizen science. This is for a, a course that I'm running at the moment. So this is where I'll just write. Um, and if I need to draw from an idea, well, then I'll go to my commonplace note, and I don't think I have anything on citizen science. No. So I've got no notes. Yeah. So that might say to me, okay, well, before I can start writing about citizen mm -hmm. science, I should go and do some reading on citizen science. Then I mm -hmm. might go to my library, which I use Zotero for. Some people will pull their library into Obsidian, and I feel like you can get to a point where obsidian becomes this hammer that you're going to use to hit everything with. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like the, the library, um, I think it can work. And I think some people have made it work. I prefer to use Zotero for my library. So I'll go to Zotero and that's where I track everything um, that I want to follow up on and read. And 
you haven't got anything on citizen science, but let's say you were going to do a piece of writing on artificial intelligence. Now, I know mm. you'll have tons of stuff. So if you opened up a writing note um, on artificial intelligence. Yeah. Show me how you'd go about drawing back on your. Um, I suppose your commonplace folder or your or your what you call the daily notes folder. How would you pull that material into what you're then going to be writing about? I don't. Um, so uh, maybe this isn't a good example because it's uh, it's just a simple definition. So let me look for. Uh, robots must adapt to norms around interaction. So this is a, a more detailed note. Right. Um, so. I might look at this and the, the concept here is that we need to have robots adapt to human norms around interaction. And in order to do that, we are really going to have people who are building robots who are familiar with human psychology and sociology and all of these ideas about how humans interact, because those are going to be the, the social and cultural norms that influence the way that robots should behave. What we're seeing yeah. is that um, uh, humans are adapting their behavior to fit around what uh, robots are capable of. So what I'm getting from this note isn't so much the content, but it's this idea. So I'm trying to capture an idea, which is that, you know, we need to design robots that adapt to our behavior and our sociology. Um, when I'm writing, I'm not looking to copy and paste information from this note. I'm trying to find ideas within the commonplace collection of notes that give me inspiration or motivation or that help me make connections to whatever I'm writing about in the writing vault. Right. But herein lies the crux of the issue, because, of course, you could do that in any form. You could do that in a Word document. You could do that in a traditional file system. You could do that in yeah. Evernote. You could do that in Ulysses. You've got many yes. places you could do that in. The point about Obsidian is not that you want to look, you're interested in that note, but I look at the bottom, for instance, at the green related text. Yeah. And the tags you've got, that little icon seems to suggest that there are three, four, five, six, seven, eight additional notes that are related to that theme. And each one of those might have eight additional notes related to them. And each yeah. one of those might have it. And it becomes exponential. Right. So. If you're talking about this just purely from a note by note basis, then I don't see Obsidian as being any different. So how do you stop the mania of the exponential increase in information you've got linked all together here and then actually write something about how robots must relate to human norms? Well, because these ideas at the bottom here where, where they link, they're related, but if I'm thinking about the way that um, robots should relate to um, to us, to groups of human beings, some of this is like, yeah, educational AI must adapt to learning science. That's a related idea because it's talking about how technology needs to adapt to something that we value, so learning science. It's a related idea, but it's not it's not going to be a part of what I'm writing about with robots. So first of all, not all of the links are necessary for me to follow. Um, types of robots in clinical practice, you can, you know, I can, without going into the notes, I can just pull it up here and look at it. Well, you know, this also isn't really relevant. This is a list of types of robot form factors and um, not behaviors, but uh, um, the kinds of tasks that these kinds of robots might be called to do. This also wouldn't really be useful for the article that I'm writing about, you know, robots and 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 human behavior. Um, this might be interesting. Social and cultural norms dictate what information is appropriate. So the point isn't just that I'm randomly following all of these links. I might look at this and say, okay, social and cultural norms dictate what information is appropriate to share with other people. Okay, so how does this relate to my idea around robots adapting to our norms. Um, so I'm going to pause with, with the note and say, you know, really reflect on it. Does this help me take my writing in a different direction? Does this spark an idea that I maybe wouldn't have got to if I was just writing? Um, so I think for me, the linking of the notes, um, if I just 
come here to edit again. Um, while I'm reading this, um, I don't know, I'm just uh, social norm. So if I come back here, um, so it's suggesting now social network theory. Is that something that I need to look at? Is social network analysis something that I need to look at? Do I need to, because now that I've seen this, maybe it sparks the idea that, you know what? The thing that I'm writing about robots, what it lacks at the moment is some kind of framework that it would you know, give what I'm writing about a little bit more substance. Maybe I need to go look at social network theory. Maybe that's something that will help me better understand the interaction between robots and people. So the way that I think about the commonplace notes is not so much that they're a kind of a, a source of information, although they definitely are, and, and I do use them in that way. But while I'm doing the writing, I just dip into the commonplace and I sometimes will just write keywords out and see what the this vault gives back to me. Sometimes it gives me back things that I'm expecting, but sometimes they're really unexpected notes that come back at me. And that, that kind of serendipity has been um, really useful in generating some of the ideas that I've been thinking about lately. When you're reviewing notes, do you ever go back over some of the related notes that you've highlighted in there and think, well, I've never really gone in that direction with this, so I'm just going to delete it. I mean, when you're writing the note and you're you're adding the you're you're prospectively trying to imagine how you're going to be using it in the future. So I'll put a tag in here to to link it to X, Y, and Z. But you don't know in five years' time or two years' time that that's actually going to be the relevant link you're going to be making. So do you have to go back and constantly edit the notes and the links? I I try not to preemptively imagine what I'm going to use the note for. So with this note, um, I don't know. If I just say, yeah, sharing the wrong information with the wrong people at the wrong time, I can decide that that might be a note worth making at some point, even though it's not a note now. So if I surround it with brackets, now this becomes a note. Um, you can see it's included now here. Um, it's a note that doesn't exist. That's what this icon means. But now if I start, and uh, I've got a new tab, it's called untitled, and I just type some random stuff. And I've got a template that I just used to add this in. And now I start saying wrong information. Ah, oh, here's a little note. And so I click that and now these two notes are connected. So I'm trying not to be too prescriptive about how I build the notes. Um, and you know what, I'll probably just leave this link here um, because who knows? Maybe in the future I'll be tr I'll be trying to think about what does the wrong information mean. Um, you know, I I don't know. Does that does that kind of give you some suggestion about how I might be thinking? To be honest, when I'm writing the mm. notes, linking the notes, I'm not thinking about it too much. I literally mm. come here to the related part, and I start thinking. So I might say this is about information, uh, information theory. Mm, so here's something about noise. Uh, this is what the field is. How do we think about error correction in information theory? So I might just add that as a keyword and then just scroll through the existing notes that I have. This will also search this. You can see a literature notes article. I've got an article on Claude Shannon, the founder of information theory. Maybe yeah. this is enough for me to now say, you know what? I should actually go and read this note. So this is a note now. I've got some highlights. So at some point I've I've read this article. Um, so I guess the, that's a very long answer to your question about, yes, the notes are constantly being edited, adapted, pruned. Um, but I don't think about that too much in the moment when I'm creating the notes. So your preference is to use three volts, but you said that some people will just throw everything into one volt and then Presumably, for some people as well, they will they will literally cut and paste from one note into another as they're building a text document. Yes, I actually I started doing that. So I started with a single vault that included daily notes, commonplace notes, and I I always found it difficult to write in Obsidian when it was linked in with the daily notes and the commonplace notes. So I've always written in something else, 
And for a while I was using VS Code, which is just another text editor. Um, I've tried loads of different text editors. I used to write a lot in Evernote when I still um, used Evernote. I've used Simple Note. Um, so I have tried to keep the writing process separated. At some mm. point, I realized that combining the daily notes and the commonplace notes just wasn't working for me. Um, because what I found is that I was using the daily notes, typing up notes, and just creating links to everything. You know, it's, it's you know just because something it, because it's so easy to link, I was just linking everything. Whereas I'm far more intentional about creating links between notes um, when I've got them separated out into this different vault. And then in my daily notes, which is just my, you know, what did I do today with, you know, meetings and random thoughts. Sometimes I'll be in a meeting and I'll, I'll have a thought about something. Somebody says something and I think, oh, that, that's an interesting point. I'll make a note of it in my daily note. And then after the meeting, I'll go and recreate that note in my commonplace. I won't link, I won't try and link to it. Um, and then I might just, you know, keep the quote there and then just leave it. And I might only come back to it in six months time when it gets surfaced as part of my kind of serendipitous search for other ideas. You know, it may be something I've completely forgotten about. So I leave a lot of notes in kind of half formed, um, you know, just, I don't know, it, it clearly isn't a real thing. Um, it's got no connections. It's got no links. And I do have a lot of notes that are orphans. So they're not connected to anything mm. else, um, mm. which also is fine. I mean, it's text. So who cares? You know, if, if that note never, ever comes up again and it remains an orphan for the next 20 years, who cares? I'm not going to go and try and prune it so that it looks pretty in the graph view. And there's definitely some things about Obsidian that I know probably resonate with you very strongly. You've talked about this before with me about the fact that, I mean, I think it's still free, um, the software. I think Inga and Jason mentioned that, that it was free for the time being. And while they would expect it at some point, it's going to be monetized at the moment, it's free. It's completely open source. Um, all the information is stored on your local computer, so it's not in a cloud anywhere. And it's all written in Markdown language. And again, this might be something that people who are not familiar with that stuff wouldn't maybe not know about, but is a really useful thing to use. If you could just open up a note, which has got some Markdown on. Yeah, so here's my commonplace vault, and here's my daily notes vault. And so that's my stored vault. on your computer. Yeah. yeah, so if I go here to commonplace, like these it's are- It's all in plain text. Yeah. Um, Categories of distraction costs. Got no idea what's in this note, but you can see. Um, oh, well, weird. This is a very old note because this template yeah. is not something that I've had for a long time. So I'll just go here and I'll say, hi, Dave. Um, and if I save this note and go back to Obsidian and I go open transaction costs so we go to categories of transaction costs it says hi dave yeah so the fact that you and can exhaust yeah just edit you can edit the plain text um it's uh, obsidian it's plain text so you don't need any fancy there you go there's the markdown language those use of yeah. um hashtags obsidian... and brackets it's basically four or five little keyboard keys that just allow you to do everything yeah obsidian isn't actually open source um, oh, okay. It's uh, just hang on a sec. Um, but they've they promised that it will always be free. Um, however, because all of the notes and all of the links between notes, it uses these uh, square brackets, and this now is the de facto standard for internal links. There's probably about five other platforms that you can use that you just basically install this other program, you point it to your folders um, and you know, off you go. I've, I've experimented with using something called Dendron, which is another um, type of, I guess, note-taking personal knowledgement um, app. And it works perfectly well. So if Obsidian goes away tomorrow, there's three or four options that I can choose from, some of which are open source. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm not worried about, um, you know, whether or not they start my, they actually are monetizing already. So you can pay for Obsidian Sync, um, which is where you can sync between devices. So you can install the mobile app on your phone and mm. then it'll sync the data between the mobile app and your, and your desktop. Um, I just use Dropbox to synchronize notes across all my devices. Um, you know, the number of times I am ever out with my phone where I absolutely have to capture a note, it's really rare. Um, mm. And then I just tend to use a simple note-taking app uh, for that. Uh, has this has this answered my question? Okay, so one of the one of the barriers then that I think a lot of people have when they hear about Obsidian and they see people's vaults libraries is they think, oh my god, it just looks daunting to document all that stuff. I mean, you're a very disciplined very productive academic in this respect you're very conscious of the ways in which you gather information store information manage how you do your personal academic knowledgement i think yeah, you're very yeah. you're very disciplined in that respect now how long have you been using obsidian uh probably about a year and a half um and in that time just ballpark how many uh days during that year and a half have you not used it well i use it every day now i live in it now every day um i've been wanting something like obsidian for almost as long as i've been an, an academic i've been collecting notes i've been collecting uh presentations uh um, articles um you know anything just collecting a lot of things and never really knowing exactly what to do with it i used to have I used to have hundreds and hundreds of notes in this uh, simple note folder. Okay, this is AI and society. These are notes that I, I could have made five years ago. I could have made it seven years ago. I have no idea, but I have these notes. I try to, if not daily, then at least on a semi-regular basis, I try to go through these notes and move these notes into Obsidian. I'm trying to work through all the articles that I've ever written and move concepts from those articles into Obsidian. My conference presentations are all going into Obsidian, um, where I'm trying to extract what is most useful, the kinds of things that are most meaningful to me, the kinds of things that I keep coming back to. Um, so I've my PhD is now almost 10 years old. I haven't done it yet, but at some point I need to go through my PhD and pull out all the pieces of information that I still refer to. Because what I do now is I go back to the PhD and I have to do a keyword search. And those But ideas... is that about you actually is that about you actually putting that material to use, or is it an archival project that that you you expect never to use some of that stuff, but you want it in one form? No. If I go through a presentation that I've given in the past, and um, I mean, I already have all of that stuff archived. It's all in my library. It's all in Zotero. So there is an archive of it, um, and I can find it, and I can go through all of that stuff really easily. What I'm trying to do is pull out pieces of information that maybe I refer to regularly, or maybe I haven't thought about it since I submitted my thesis. Um, but I want I want it to be useful, and the, you know I've got notes that I haven't looked at. So after I made these notes on AI and society, I haven't looked at these notes since I made them, because it's really difficult to go through you know this long document and find something useful because this is not from a single source. This is all pulled out from multiple sources. But in reality, in re I mean this is. I suppose get back to the crux of the issue with Obsidian. If you started reading just the notes you'd got on Obsidian, never mind the ones you'd got in Evernote and OneNote and Zotero and wherever else you've stored them over the years, if you're anything like me, you'll write a lot of stuff all the time. Oh, Siri's just wants to interject here. Hang on. Let's shut that off. There'll be millions of words of notes already in there. And of course, every day that you are using Obsidian and writing more notes, you would have to read 10 notes that exist for every one that you write just to get through them all. So the likelihood is 
you will never read some of those notes, many of them, perhaps most of them. So you're generating a ton of material of which only the tiniest fraction you're ever going to use. And so I guess Obsidian helps in the sense that on the one hand, it would help you find the stuff that you want in the moment much faster, more, much more efficiently than if you're just doing a hand trawl. I get that. But there's an enormous amount of work involved just on the off chance that you're going to be wanting that note in the future. Yeah. Is it worth it? I mean, uh, just to like go back to the Inga and Jason conversation, there was a sentence in there that struck me really strongly that resonated very much with my kind of state of mind about this. Inga said to Jason, this she was looking at this rotating three-dimensional map that he had of his vault for this Texa review. And she said it's beautiful to look at. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if the reviewers could just have that? And of course, her point was similar to me, I think that the kind of knowledge that's implied in a text review is three-dimensional. You would want a reviewer to, to pursue a link that goes in that direction or possibly that direction or takes you in that direction and to be able to then track back and then go that way and this way. Of course, that's not the document that they ask for. What they ask for is section one is on standard one. How does the university manage its governance to ensure the quality of academic delivery. Chapter two is about statement two. So she's saying it's lovely to a point. I think this is what she's saying. It's lovely to a point, but at some point you're going to have to turn that three dimensional map into a two dimensional document. And that's where I think A, is all of that work worth it? And B, does Obsidian just make the task more difficult rather than making it more straightforward? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't use Obsidian to create the kind of document that he's talking about because that kind of document and that kind of process, in my opinion, is inherently hierarchical and very structured. Obsidian mm. is really good for things that are unstructured, like the thoughts that bounce around in your head and connect to other ideas you know, without you really thinking about it too much. So I think Obsidian is really valuable for that. I you, I might write that other document using Obsidian because you can still use folders and separate notes and you can still create links between the documents so that it's easy to go from one to the other. But in that case, it would be more uh, like a cross-referenced Word document. Um, and so Obsidian can be used for that kind of writing as well. And I think just using it as a plain text or markdown writing editor works really well for that. So if I was going to write a long structured hierarchical document that's all about sections and chapters, I'd still use Obsidian, but the internal links wouldn't be about connecting ideas. It would be about internal references. So if you want to see the policy document that this chapter is informed by, well, then here's a link to that policy document. That might be worth doing, um, but I was, less enthusiastic about the way that he's using it um, for that project. So if there was a, this is a very binary kind of image, but on a line that goes from fully creative, innovative, um, messy thinking through to the kind of productivity, so creativity to productivity at this end, where productivity is the most mundane, quotidian, everyday, much of the work we have to do in academia, um, the actual production of an article or production of a book or production of a report or production of a class schedule or something. Would you say that Obsidian for you sits closer towards the creative messy end of the scale? No, it fits, mm. it fits in multiple places. That's why I have three vaults. Right, so you have a vault for different kinds of yeah, so it, like the, crea the creativity side of things is my commonplace fault. And that's where I dump ideas and that's where I'm trying to extract information from things that I've done in the past or I see a picture or a cartoon. I put all of that stuff in there. Those are things that make me happy and give me delight. And, you know, the, just the world is an interesting place and I want to capture th interesting things about the world. So a quote that I come across, I've got poems in there. You know, it's just a place that give me joy 
when I come across them again, and I may not have other opportunities to come across them again. And so there's that part of it. It's commonplacing, and that's why I like the commonplace name for it. Um, it's just this collection of things that I think are wonderful in the world. Um, there are definitions and, and that sort of thing in there as well. Um, but I'm in a very different mindset when I'm working in that compared to when I'm in a writing, when I'm in the writing vault. And both of those mindsets are very different to where I'm at when I'm in the daily notes vault. When I'm in daily notes, I'm in meetings, I'm in emails, I'm in the administrative part of higher education. And I spend most of my day in my daily notes vault, unfortunately. But it's given me a structure and a way of managing what can sometimes feel like the overwhelming chaos of everything that's going on around me in the part of my job that um, maybe is a little bit less structured. So my daily notes gives me structure and it allows me to plan out my day, plan out my week, plan out my month. I set objectives. I allocate time to those objectives. It's, as you say, it's the mundane kind of daily operational stuff that allows us to make progress. Um, so that's my daily notes. And I spend a lot of time in daily notes. But for about an hour a day, if I'm reading an article and I see a passage that resonates with me, I'll pull out that passage. In the whole article, I might pull out five passages, maybe. They resonate with me. I store the article in Zotero and that's my library. It's now there and I take notes, and but I may only pull out five passages with a little bit of a note about what those passages mean to me. They may be completely disconnected from what the author, from what the author meant. But when I read this, it made me think of this. I pull that into my commonplace. I put the quote, reference it, and then I write a little thing. When I read this, it made me think of this. I link that to other notes. It's a way of trying to, for me, stimulate a creative process, um, that I don't feel when I'm writing. When I'm writing, I'm trying to move an argument from A to B. Um, sometimes I get stuck. Sometimes I refer to the commonplace, but not always. I'm actually mostly referring to Zotero because I'm looking for support for arguments and I'm getting that out of Zotero. So I'm using, excuse me. So in, in practical ahead. terms, you do your writing in a different app. It might as well be. For the longest time, I did my writing in a different app so that I kept it separate from um, you know, the creativity, the operational stuff. And I've used VS Code um, to do quite a lot of writing in the past. Um, as I say, I've used Evernote, Simple Note. Um, and then I realized I just had this app. You know, I can do the same thing in Obsidian. Um, and with Obsidian with a few keyboard shortcuts, I can strip away all the Chrome so that it really is just a cursor on a blank screen. And that, that's what I'm going to be writing in. I'm just wondering, you know, where we go next, because I, I love this conversation. It was really well, cool. I, I've already started looking around for something that I can pull into Obsidian that's going to surface notes for me um, when I need it. I want, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of touched on this idea. Um, Am I am I just recreating in Obsidian something that looks a little bit prettier, is maybe a little bit more efficient than trawling through some of my existing notes? I don't think it is, and, and maybe I don't have a good reason for that, but I do know that when I saw Obsidian, I felt like I'd, I saw the solution to a question that I've been asking for more than 10 years. And- Jason said the same thing, didn't he, in the podcast? Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for me, it was, you know, I, I saw it and I thought my search is over. I've I found the thing that I've been looking for. Maybe that says more about my personality and my need to gather things, control things. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I can definitely say that I, I feel a sense of, of delight and joy when I'm putting things into Obsidian and it triggers off sometimes a series of connections that maybe I would have had anyway. Um, 
but I really do find that I have, I feel this is, I mean, completely subjective, obviously, but I feel like I have come up with more creative ideas since using Obsidian than before. And maybe the same would have been true if I was making notes on a piece of paper. Maybe it's not Obsidian. Maybe it's the fact that now I'm spending half an hour to an hour a day thinking about things. Maybe that's what uh, has led to me feeling like I've got more creative ideas. But for me, there, there has been enormous value in, in the process. Well, I've got one more offering for you before I go. And I've been away after I saw you, after we met in the UK, I went to Italy, as you know, and uh, I went, I started a week in Bologna. And in the Bologna Museum of Modern Art, they have this. See this? Uh, yeah. So it's a 3D printed guy. Yeah. And in Bologna, they have local slang for this kind of thing. It's called Umarel. Okay. And it says on the box here, uh, the hardest thing to do is to work hard when nobody's watching you. So they have these, like in probably most cities, men, retired men, older men, who stand outside usually building sites where the grill, where the wire mesh is around the building site. And they stand there like this. And they look and they kind of comment on the fact that they shouldn't be doing it like that. And they stand there for hours. So this has been made as a 3D printed thing. Increase your productivity with your personal email. <laughs> Just place it on your desk and let him watch over you. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. I love it. Do you know? So I have my own personal email. I, I love that. I need one of those because something, one of the earliest things that I put into Obsidian was a little quote um, that uh, I just think about all the time. It says, somewhere, someone is working harder than you. <laughs> and I always think of that and I always think, oh, damn it. Like, Paranoia. I need, I, need to, I need to do more. I need to be better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Marx would be turning in his grave. <laughs> cool. All right. If you have any other questions about Obsidian, come back to me. I know where to it. come. I, I enjoyed this conversation. It was good. Took yeah. us into Thanks, different Michael. places. It certainly did. <laughs>